questions? Yeah. All right, it's being recorded, great. Okay, so I'm gonna start off just giving a brief introduction about what the heck commonplace books actually are. Um, and then Laura and Sam here are gonna um, kind of give a brief rundown of ways that they've implemented it in their classrooms. And then we'll go to questions, but feel free to pipe up during the middle as well if you have any comments or questions as well. So if you guys are anything like me, um, when you're in the classroom, there's basically two things that I'm always trying to do with my students. I'm always trying to get my students to actually do their reading, um, which is like a huge struggle every semester. Um, and if they actually do their reading, I'm trying to get them to engage with it in a thoughtful and provoking manner, um, provocative manner rather. So one way that we've all tried to do this is through what are called commonplace books. And it's something that we've seen success with in our classrooms. And so we wanted to, to share some of this today. So what exactly is a commonplace book? Well, according to Stephen Johnson, who is a big fan, um, an academic who's a big fan of these, he said that scholars, amateur scientists, aspiring men of letters, just about anyone with intellectual ambition in the 17th and 18th centuries was likely to keep a commonplace book. And in its most customary form, commonplacing, as it was called, involved writing interesting or inspirational passages from one's reading to assemblize a personalized encyclopedia of quotations. So it's basically like the Tumblr of the 17th century in a lot of ways. Now, Stephen Johnson here, you can see, has done his huge commonplace book by topic. Um, we don't do anything so in depth, but, hold on here a second. Basically, what, what people in the 17th century were experiencing was a huge explosion of knowledge. The printing press had come out a, few, a little bit ago, and people were extremely worried that there was a huge information overload, and they had no way to actually call through it and organize it. And so one way to actually start doing this was, as you were reading, to write down important quotes that you came across, often by theme, and comment on them as a way to engage with the reading as you were going through whatever reading you were doing. It was also a memory aid. Um, here, if you look here, we have Thomas Jefferson, who is a huge fan of commonplace books. Um, he actually kept two during his life. He had one for literature that he read, and he had one for his legal studies. And here on the right, you can see his legal studies commonplace book. He would write down important quotes from the legal texts he was, he was reading, and then he would engage with them at, at the bottom to, to think through them. Um, these commonplace books would actually often help him prepare for court cases when he was a lawyer, these sorts of things. And it was also a way to keep quotes and ideas in your mind long after you'd read a book. If you're anything like me, once you read a book, a few days later, you've kind of forgotten some of the most important points of it all. Um, in fact, I think studies recently have shown that if you don't go over what you've recently read, um, or study, you only retain about 10% of what you've read um, about a week later. And so I think people back in the 17th century, 18th century knew this, and so they kept commonplace books as a way to quickly find their engagements with readings. And there's a lot of very famous people that have kept commonplace books. Marcus Aurelius, um, the, the Greek philosopher, John Locke, Thomas Jefferson, of course, E.M. Forster, who is a uh, literary giant and Ronald Reagan. So the complex book has a very large and lengthy literary sort of um, pedigree. And from there, we kind of want to go into some of the ways that we've implemented these things in the classroom. And then we're, we're more than happy to take questions. All right, so when you create an assignment, um, when you ask your students to keep a commonplace book, I think interestingly, and maybe ironically, it's important to set parameters, especially at the beginning. Um, one of the things that we found also, um, we taught an interdisciplinary general education class last semester that was a class on, um, it was a integrated class between um, humanities and life sciences. So basically like a biology slash class, interestingly. Um, and this course, one of the requirements that we had for our students was they had a reading for each discipline each week and they had to make a pretty much a full page entry 
in their commonplace books. So we set up parameters at the very beginning to show them and, and um, kind of just anticipate what show them our expectations, I guess, and then anticipate what some of their concerns or, or uncertainties about this might be. Um, so it's important that you do that, that you start out with some parameters, be consistent with those, but then also flexibility is important. Um, we, this was our second go round with this class. And the first time we both had very, very different expectations in terms of what we were looking for in their reading responses. And so this time we decided to just make one uniform, um, assignment prompt basically and for whatever reading they were engaged with that week they were or whatever readings plural um they were basically doing the same thing from week to week but then also flexibility if there were things that they wanted to do that were interesting to them we kind of just let them run with it and they really really caught fire with it actually um so this was the prompt that we used kind of going back and forth over um the the weeks leading up to the semester before we settled on this um so you can kind of read through what our expectations were um they needed to tell us what the reading was summarize it and that was just our way of kind of checking in and making sure that they were doing it and then to include some kind of a drawing this the we do like color that was my favorite part it was actually <laughs> dr wells addition to that um we do like color and so do you because really like that's when our our artistic roots are very much in color um and i think we were trying to kind of tap into that that youthful curiosity right when you're a kid and everything in the world is exciting and you want to learn and learn and learn from every source you possibly can so we were really trying to help them reach that place in themselves again um, and then from there, we gave them choices about what to do. So this was where the flexibility really came into it. Um, just some suggestions, you know, you might want to do these things. And at the beginning, they pretty much did. And a lot of them actually would try to do every single one of these bullet points, which didn't work out super well always. Um, but as the semester went on and as they sort of like caught on to what this was all about, they would even add in their own things that they wanted to do. Um, and so again, we wanted to give them a lot of choice and also make it clear what, what kinds of things we were looking for in these commonplace books. So some examples of how color was used and you can kind of see here that different students interpreted that differently right so in the the first entry you can see which was in response oh actually both of these were in response to thoreau's essay huckleberries um the the color was minimal and it was just used to illustrate one of the drawings that the student did whereas the student on the right really did some pretty sophisticated color coding and this especially was something that kind of just developed through the semester for them. Like they would kind of settle on what, what worked for them in terms of how they wanted to use the color um, and what the color sort of like signified. So it became a kind of like personalized key almost for them. This was not something that we said, okay, when you, color, when you highlight something in pink, this is what it means. And when you highlight it in yellow, this is what it means. This was just the student's own again, sort of interpretation of, of the assignment. Um, so yeah, different uses of color. You can also see different artistic levels, right? And we basically, we required them to do some kind of a drawing. Um, and it was pretty, it, it was pretty loosely defined. So um, they could even just sketch out some shapes if they wanted to. Most of them really, really jumped in with both feet. But you can see, um, looking at these comparisons, you know, some students were very, um, artistically driven and and really set their commonplace books up in a way that even I was kind of jealous of <laughs> the, the art that went into it with the different scripts, um, the the drawings that they did. And then some students, you know, it was just kind of a basic drawing, but something that symbolized some meaning that they derived from the reading, right? So this one um, that's on the left was a, it was a poem um, called Flower Song. And basically the, the premise 
was just that that we are one with nature and that nature is all connected. And so that was the that was what that student was trying to to signify with that with the drawing that they did. Um, so again, really letting them take the initiative and take the lead and create what they wanted to create out of these common place books. Um, you can also see that some students had more or less to say about a particular reading. So we set, um, I think we set a minimum of 200 words and said that students, um, they had to include at least one drawing, but each drawing they included could count for 20 words. And <laughs> there were some students who really you know, wanted, like they wanted their word count to be at a minimum. They didn't want to have to write a lot. They wanted to mostly draw, so that was fine. Um, but, but again, you can see how these students connected with the reading based on not only what they said, but really based on two, on the quantity of what they had to say. So this particular reading for this student um, on the left, you can tell was very meaningful because the student spent a lot of time and energy, not only doing a drawing, um, but then also like really pulling from the text and um, reflecting on it and, and kind of just drawing from it in terms of things that were interesting, things that were meaningful, things that were resonant. Um, and and this was this was probably about midway through the semester that this reading came up, um, and and you can see that by then students were really doing their own thing with the commonplace books. Um, the one on the right is actually a student um, who's a current student of mine, and this assignment is no longer a requirement for the course that the student is in, but he has decided that he still wants to keep using it. And so he's still sub been submitting commonplace entries um, and basically said that this is something that he wants to keep doing and keep learning from for, for life, basically. I mean, really like some of these students really, it really, really caught fire with them. So, and I think, yeah, so this is how it could be used in a different class setting. Yeah, so hi, I'm, uh, I teach, I'm Sam Wells, I teach biology here at SUU, as well as uh, team teaching with, with Laura, etc. So let, let me uh, just reiterate some things because uh, I just feel like reiterating them, I'm so sorry. But uh, one of the real values to me uh, of the commonplace book is when the assignment is made and then it's due before we actually have that reading discussion in class. And, you know, Spencer mentioned earlier at the beginning, like, how do you get your students motivated and stuff to read? But when they have to turn this in, before you have a discussion in class, it turns the discussion in class into just a wonderful experience. And uh, I really wasn't expecting how lovely it was going to be last semester when Laura and I started teaching this. I mean, the, the students just, they wanted to keep going. I mean, there were times we went right up to the end of the hour, instead of stuffing books into their backpacks, they want to keep talking because, they're having opinions about something that's really I mean, it's academic and relevant. So um, we really, and we're still doing it now because we've seen how it works. Um, I tried last semester with the COVID issues raging um, to implement it into a biology laboratory. And it was a bit of a brave thing to do because biology students aren't necessarily by nature what I thought would be necessarily commonplace book material. But the issue is the following. We had normally two hour labs and we decided as a department to break those into A and B sections to limit transmission of the virus. And so we had half as many students, which was good, but then we only had one hour um, to teach a lab that normally goes up to two hours. And so I decided, you know, this might be the opportunity for a commonplace book because what a commonplace book is, it's self-motivated learning, right? And uh, some students, would say, well, what's the difference between a commonplace book and just a regular lab notebook? And at first that kind of caught me like a little bit off guard because to me, commonplace book was, well, I'd learned about it from Spencer years ago, but uh, I sort of internalized it and took some things for granted. Um, so I had to ask myself, what is the difference between a commonplace book and a regular notebook? And to me, the real difference is that people take notebooks or, or make entries in notebooks for all kinds of different things could be just a, a list, a grocery list, or um, a calendaring items, items of some sort. But as Spencer mentioned, the, uh, the commonplace book really is 
For us that are lifelong learners, it's our notebook of learning facts. And um, I, I really wanted students to capture this. It's their decision. It's a notebook that is just there to get you through the class. Maybe it's just a notebook. It's not really a commonplace book in the, I guess the idealistic sense of what the commonplace book is supposed to be. It's, it's almost like the difference between taking notes for a test, right? I mean, that's the question that students yeah. always ask. Is this gonna be on the test? Is this gonna be on the final? Yeah. Um, versus taking notes for yourself. Would you yeah, know? absolutely. Yeah. So, so how do I do that in, in a laboratory setting? Well, is I wanted them to learn some things on their own outside of lab that we didn't get to because we didn't have enough time in those abbreviated labs and have a more meaningful learning experience. Um, and it worked good the first semester, um, but one of the things that ended up happening is their self-directed learning ended up being from all over the place and was not really, I, I felt that meaningful in most of the cases. So what I did the second semester, I continued with it this semester, but I added the, the D here on the slide, the peer reviewed information as a means of getting them into the scientific literature and learning for themselves, not just random stuff from the internet, uh, but to actually learn from themselves from peer reviewed literature. And so I, I kind of narrowed that down and uh, it's gone better this semester that way. So basically what I, in the laboratory, what I have them do every week is submit their commonplace entry. Um, they have their commonplace book, they take a picture of the entry and then they upload it. And uh, these are the headings that they have to have. They have the main lab findings. So they have some flexibility there. Instead of just a, a standard lab manual, fill in these items and what did we do, turn that in, um, they have more flexibility. That doesn't mean they, they get away from not learning, they get away from learning the material in the lab. I still quiz them and give them exams on that. So they have to learn that material. But for the, the main lab findings of their commonplace books, they have a lot of flexibility and they go in lots of different directions. Um, they also have a, a, a lab uh, semester long research project that they're doing. And sometimes they're not motivated to work on that until the month or even weeks before it's due. So this is a way to help me get them started early. Um, in that regard. Vocabulary is important to me as a teacher to help my students really learn things. And uh, so I have them write down vocabulary and, and actually tell me a little bit about how they've used throughout the week. And then the peer reviewed information, I'm just gonna read this. Find something interesting from your own research on the topic of the week's lab, something that we didn't cover in lab, but that you discover on your own you will need to find this information from the scientific literature and cite the source in proper APA format. APA format is because that's what we work on in the lab. Any format obviously would be appropriate. And then if they don't have 300 words, which is the assignment, so I make this a little bit more rigid than, than the class of R and I have because uh, I just do. And it's because I have a lot of um, pre-med students that are and nursing students that are vying for each other's um, grade. Not that I grade on a curve, I don't, but. Still, I, I just, I step it up a little bit and I want them to actually include other things that they find interesting in their, in their research. And then this idea of being creative in a scientific lab, I hesitated about that because most science majors, I, I better not say the word most, many science majors are just not artistic. So um, it doesn't mean they're not creative. Some of them are very creative, but so I was hesitant about this, but then, Having the experience that Laura and I had with the artistic part of it um, last semester, I decided to go with it as well. And I'm really glad that I did because there are a number of students that are taking science labs, science class that are a little bit hesitant about their ability as the scientists, or as budding scholars, um, analytically, analytical thinking, this sort of thing, that being able to be creative in an assignment like this helps them engage with the class a lot better. And those that are just not capable of artwork, you know what, they don't really lose that many points. I mean, I, I encourage them to use color and if nothing else to just draw squares and circles, something. And I actually bring up the, the literature, the scientific literature showing that when you actually draw something, um, are creative that way, you learn the material better. And so it's not just that here's this biology teacher trying to teach the student to be artistic. Um, it is, I guess, you can interpret it that way, but really there's actually an academic reason behind it. And it has been, it has been a great way for students to actually learn things. I, I'm, I'm sold on it. I just, I'm gonna keep doing it. Anyway, it's probably been talking long enough. Let's just see an example. So here's 
Um, uh, there we go. Here's an example of a student that was really more artistic, but somehow um, decided to, you know, go more artsy than some other students, but still get everything in. And uh, I could show you all kinds of examples, but we don't have enough time for that. But um, a lot of them don't look this good, I will tell you that. But um, I think maybe it's just to kind of give you the flavor of what it looks like. Oh, well, there's just another one. Well, do we have any comments or questions or people who've experienced using these before or want to know more? We'll open up the floor to people. Um, can I, I'll ask a question. Um, so in my experience, getting students or, or anyone to engage in drawing is pretty difficult. Um, there seems to be a lot of things that have happened in people's past that have convinced them that they cannot draw even simple sketches. Um, did you guys encounter a lot of like specific resistance towards the drawing aspect of this? No, I don't like that. And what did you do to overcome that, I guess? I, I would say really, we didn't really give them a choice in a way. <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds harsh, but it was almost like, we were just, we just enthusiastically sort of said, this is what you're going to do. And maybe they did have concerns or resistance, but we, we did actually show some examples the first week. So we, we pulled different people had, had submitted and with a wide variety of, of artistic ability. Um, so we, it wasn't like we said, oh, this is what you should be doing. Look at this fantastic art. It was like, hey, this is one way you could do it. You could do it this way. Again, people did just really simple, basic drawings. And I mean, I, we didn't get any vocal pushback on it. Yes. Yeah. Also, I think one of the things that I may have dropped the anxiety level a little bit is we told them we were not grading them on their artistic ability. Um, we just wanted them to just draw something. And um, I think that may have helped some as well. Some, some people just never got into the drawing bit. And so they were just drawing lines, right? Series of lines was their artistic effort. And, and that's fine. But, but the, the flip side of that is for those people that are, have even a little bit of artistic ability, um, it really, it is so worthwhile for them that it's, it, for that reason alone, I think it's worth doing. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, so um, so I don't know, some of you may have, have heard, there's a new book out called How to Think Like Shakespeare, and it talks about how people learn during the Renaissance. And uh, one of the things that, that it talks about in this book is, is how people would copy things and how copying, copying things down, and, and in this context of commonplace books, quotes, copying those things down kind of gets you inside the mind of the creator and can kind of help you to, um, to kind of improve your own process and your own skills. And so I don't know if, if you had any, anything like that in mind with this, or if it was just strictly to, for students to collect knowledge, but I didn't know if, if that had any bearing on your decision to do this. That's a great question. Um, in fact, so I, I teach history here at SMU and I, I make them do a commonplace book in there. And at first, when I started doing it, what I got pushed back on was actually, oh, you're actually going to make us write this thing out? Why can't I just type it? Right? And I said, you know, I'm having you guys write this out because I'm a firm believer that if you actually take a pen or a pencil and you write something out, literature has shown that you actually internalize what you're engaging with more. And I haven't thought about it of getting you in the mindset of the, the um, authors that they're reading so much, but I think that's exactly right, too you're not only internalizing what you think, but you're internalizing their arguments and the way in which they argue. And I think that's a valuable skill. So I, I need to read that book. <laughs> Do you know who the author is on that book? I'd like to know. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Awesome, Great. thank you. Um, hi, I have a question as well. Um, I was actually thinking about um, all of us, this talk that goes around about grading and how students just try to get the grade and we're trying to foster lifelong learners and, and yes, we have to grade them, but if we could just get them to love learning, that would be great. And I, I view this as a great tool to do that. Um, and I like the, 
I don't know, the diversity of, of options that students have with the tool. So I guess I just wondered if you could comment and maybe if you've had feedback from students in particular on the role this plays in fostering that lifelong learning and also like content and skill acquisition um, and how maybe that helps students rethink the purpose of their education. If you've had any, if you have any comments or thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I don't want to steal some of Laura Sunder because I think she's fighting the bit to answer some of that. <laughs> um, um, but we have, so um, I have two students in my class this semester, actually three, excuse me, I have three students in my class this, classes this semester that had experience with commonplace books before. Um, all three of them are still using their commonplace book. And in fact, um, they even come up kind of sheepishly and ask, because in, in at least one of those cases, the assignment that I'm giving them is not really open for, um, it's, 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 it's a very defined assignment with you know, clear cut um, rubric and everything else. And yet, so they come up kind of sheepishly, can I kind of do this in my commonplace book, kind of go in my own direction on this? And at first I'm thinking, well, hmm, how do I be consistent, <laughs> right, in my grading for all this? And I'm saying, okay, I love that you're doing this. And then finally I said, go for it. <laughs> Don't quote me on it. I'm quoted on it already, so whatever. But um, I, I love, I was just so flattered, though, that all three of those out of three are still using their commonplace books. That is just obviously those three, and it's probably not 100%, but for those three, they have caught the vision of it. And that's, that's very cool. I feel, I feel too like part of part of what makes them want to keep going with it is we encourage them to buy a big old fat notebook and they don't use the whole thing. And so, I mean, you can see from the size of this that, you know, in one semester, if they're doing one or two of these a week, they're not going to fill up a whole notebook. And so I think there's something almost incentivizing just in having like a half full notebook that they're like, well, I might as well keep going with this. Um, and yeah, I've had a similar experience with a student who, I mean, gave me, unintentionally gave me a testimonial to this in one of his um, submissions this semester, where he used his commonplace book to, to respond to a reading. Um, the assignment was completely different, but he was like, I'm still using this and I want to keep using it for the rest of my life. So there's something about this level of engagement that really, I think, inspires that sort of, what, what was can, the term? Can I add something? Yeah. I, 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 I like what you're saying here, Lord. I, I think for me, what, what it is, is that they have finally taken ownership of something. That's what, that's what right? exactly they, it. Yeah. They have to comment on all these things. And by the end, they, they can look physically at what they've written over the course of the semester. And they see page after page after page of their own engagement with really other smart people and their own smart thoughts um, in response. So I think by the end, they're like, I have something to say, like, and that means something. Can I just comment too quickly? I remember we actually, at the end of the semester, we actually asked them to go back through their commonplace book entries, discover what there was was most meaningful for them, and to do a um, kind of a another reflection piece, sort of, on that as in another assignment. So we kind of did encourage that in a sense. Yeah, and I, I think it's so different than when you just have a bunch of electronic submissions, right? Like if you're doing, if you're just submitting something in whatever your LMS is and you're just typing it in and uploading it, you, you don't, there you don't have that same ownership of it, I guess. And you're not, and you can't go back through, I mean, it's tedious to go back through and look at it because it's not all it's not a compendium of your learning the way this is. So that's a really great question. These are really, really good questions. Thank you guys. Um, anything else? I have a question. Sorry, I'll turn my camera on in a second. Um, and that is I'm in a teaching workshop and they use an online thing called Perusal and they upload the readings in there. And then um, you read it and you can comment in it and your fellow students will see what you've commented. And so that it's a more of a social interaction around the reading. And um, with these a commonplace book, it's very individual, right? I read my thing, I have my own thoughts and this is my drawing. <clears throat> so I'm wondering how could you get that more 
the social learning where you discuss the readings together and glom onto what other people found interesting or confusing? Does that make sense? It does, and that's a really good question. Um, I also just saw the question in the chat, so I want to respond to that one too. But yeah, in terms of your question, what I, I don't know what you're I mean, I, I think for me, I mean, there, there is always an individualistic um, component in the conference book, and I don't think you're ever going to escape that if this is something that you want to do. But at the same time, I've noticed that this is a really good catalyst for starting good discussion in class as well. And if you use, but because they have to turn in their entries before class starts, I have a chance to go over all of them. And I'm able to say, hey, um, Susie there had this really good comment um, about the reading. And it acts as a springboard to get other people engaged because they all have they all come into class prepared having something to say. And so they're able to bounce off each other. And, and so in that way, I think inside the classroom, it can lend to a much more social engagement. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And that was something we, we did also. Yeah, I definitely noticed better discussion this last semester than previous. So that is an interesting idea, though. And I do wonder about having, because it, it, it was an informal way of them responding to each other's commonplace books. But I do wonder if there's a way that that could be formalized a little bit. There probably is. That's a good point. I, I, sounds like that's you, Anne, right? So that's awesome, Anne. Thanks for your comment. Thank you. I love this idea. I, I love it so much. <laughs> it, it was really, really fantastic. Um, kind of game changing for us. Um, and then somebody in the chat asked how we graded based on the number of words. Um, <laughs> we, kind of, we kind of cheated. We had a TA. And so that was actually something during the first two or three weeks of the semester, we had her go through and count roughly and give us a kind of estimate so that we could get a sense of, of how many words each student took. Um, we also cheated in another little way too. We, um, we said that if you have a, a drawing that that can count as so many words. So we were encouraging the illustration in that as well. And I don't think, I, I better let Laura speak for herself, but I'm not counting the words. I mean- I don't either. I mean, <laughs> I, I've read so many of these things now that I, I okay, maybe I'm counting by tens um, or something like that, because I think this is just not really enough and I just don't want to uh, deceive myself. Let's all count to make sure. But I mean, if they're even close, I, I usually Can I add one thing on that? Yeah, and we're yeah. actually almost there. Okay, I'll, I'll just add quickly that basically what I'm trying to get them to do is to write a good solid paragraph. And if I can see that they've done that, then I just give the points. I had one person that listed out like line by line the number of words he had done the first time. I was like, dude, you don't have to do that. Like, I'm not that concerned about that part of it. Yeah, it's, it's almost more of just a, I don't want to say scare tactic, but <laughs> we're setting a bar for them and they, and they pretty much met that bar. And we could tell after a while, like if it was too, a little bit too short. So. so I think, yeah, I think we're out of time. Um, good suggestions. Yeah, and they would take a picture of it and, and submit the photo. So not really scanning it in, but just, you know, the modern version of that where they would just snap a picture and then upload that. So that's what all of these are. I hope we got all the questions. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for joining. We had a wonderful time with you guys. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to get in contact with us. I'm sure our email is probably the page. And, um, thank you so much for joining. See you guys. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to be dropping a uh, link to a feedback survey in the chat if you all fill that out. And thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank, thank you thank so you. much. Have a good rest of your day, everyone.